This webinar is being broadcast from the land of the Nisqually. I'd like to acknowledge that wherever you are, this virtual meeting is being held on the traditional lands of Washington Native Americans. We acknowledge their commitment to the resurgence of their traditional ways and their respect and protection of all people, not only those who are living, but also those who have gone before and who are yet to be born. We pay our respect to the elders, both past and present, and to the valued resource the tribe has defined as their children. They are the tribe's future. We ask that participants of this meeting also honor the tribal lands on which each of you are located today. I'd like to ask that we offer a moment of silence to reflect on the uncertainty we feel during this time of unrest. I want to acknowledge the pain, anger, and confusion we all feel about the future for our communities and families of color and for education. We will now have a 60 second moment of silence. The statement you see on the screen was adapted from a statement put out by Puget Sound ESD. Thank you. We start each webinar reviewing OSPI's vision, mission, and values. Our values have never been more important than they are during this challenging time. OSPI values ensuring equity, collaboration and service, achieving excellence through continuous improvement, and focus on the whole child. OSPI developed an equity statement that we think helps frame our webinars. We believe each student, family, and community possesses strengths and cultural knowledge that benefit their peers, educators, and schools. This webinar is brought to you through the Office of System and School Improvement. Our objectives. Today, we're planning for the future, moving from the known to the unknown, adapting your system of supports through a planning process, maintaining a positive culture of learning in your building. My name is Bonnie Zimmerman. I'm joined today by Gonzaga University, Suzanne Gertz and Chuck Selena. With them are Kim Frank, Principal of Chief Kamayakan Elementary, Dave Martinez, Assistant Principal of Sunnyside High School, and Molly Hammaker teals Principal of Southridge High School in Kennewick. Chuck and Suzanne, I think, are gonna kick us off. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome back, those of you that were with us this morning, and welcome to those that are joining us this afternoon. As we mentioned in the previous webinar, that all of us were collecting some form of data pre-COVID. We were most of that data centered around behavior, achievement, attendance, and some of us social emotional needs of students. And from that data, we were trying to do systems of support that support teaching and learning. Then our crisis hit, and all of a sudden things shifted in terms of what became important. So a lot of districts started making personal contact with their students and parents to see if they're safe and if everything was okay. And then as time progressed, those same districts, many started looking at connectivity. How do we connect students to the school with internet, hardware, software, et cetera? As we started to adapt to the situation, we started to evolve of some form of emergency learning. And by emergency learning, many of us we're really trying just to get kids to show up, stay engaged at some level, and keep the relationship intact. As we move forward now, and many of us have been at it trying to figure out how, what's next, we're trying to get more and more intentional that we are delivering content in a way to ensure students are engaged in learning. And what are the forms of systems that support that learning? And so as we move into next year, it, it's quite possible many of us will be engaged in, in distance learning at some level or some alternative, maybe a hybrid system or partial days, et cetera. But as we look forward to the future, how do we see it as an opportunity? How we learn from the past in terms of moving forward and building on and developing our future. As Lewis Carroll said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So today we're gonna to talk about the planning process and Suzanne's gonna begin sharing something what we call systemic goals and how systemic goals or timeless goals, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, how these goals help us in the planning process. Suzanne? So this morning, we threw around the phrase systemic goals. And if you were able to find the advanced organizer document outline, and I abbreviated it on that sheet, SG, systemic goals. Let's talk about systemic goals because they are the foundation of what we will discuss in terms of planning, which we focus on the 45-day plan. So there is no 45-day planning without these systemic goals. 
they are unlike PLC goals and SMART goals that you're used to, which still exist and still have a role, but these are different. They're more complex. They go building wide at the building level. They're aspirational and they cross multiple domains. We worked with one of them in the 101 session this morning. We just didn't really talk a lot about what we meant by the phrase systemic goals because it was more appropriate here. On the left-hand side, a systemic goal crosses content areas, looks at multiple data sources at the same time, focuses on the culture versus a singular outcome. It uh, impacts and engages uh, all stakeholders. It helps us understand the process within the context, and that's, the, that's my word, context, context, context. So helps us understand the process within the context of a problem of practice. And it focuses on a CBE for adults and students that connect, build, and envision. So they're not those singular data points like graduation rate. They're not a one content area achievement like a test score or a behavioral outcome. It's more complex than that. And so you're probably saying, well, just tell us what it is then. We can imagine there's a lot of great systemic goals out there, but we typically work with four categories of systemic goals when we're working with schools. And this morning we worked on the first one. This afternoon we're going to primarily focus on the first three, but right now I'm going to walk you through the four categories. So number one, looking at data-informed school-wide systems of support. So that's what we talked about this morning. What data are you collecting and how do we flex that muscle to look a little differently and shift to the, the distance learning model in order to build these new or revised or transition systems of support. So that's one category of systemic goals. And we don't phrase it that way. That is not a systemic goal, that's a category. And if you want more information on these systemic goals, the handbook that will guide you to at the end of this session is a great resource. The second one is where we typically see that classroom or departmental grade level work, PLC work, and that's looking at the curriculum instruction and assessment cycle. The third category of systemic goals focuses on extended learning supports with the school and the community. And then the fourth one is school and community relationships. So the big idea is we're taking things that have worked for us, which is this framework we're discussing now, and we're just shifting them to plan for the future. So the very cool thing about systemic goals is they never go away, they're timeless. And so you're going to hear more show and tell from our other guest panelists today that will talk about how their systemic goals didn't change when the rug got pulled out from under us and we all went to quarantine. Systemic goals stayed the same. And so they really give you an anchor, a foundation in times of chaos, a real clarity of what we need to do. As we talk to these schools about what did change within these categories of systemic goals, it was more aligned to the questions that they had to ask. What questions are you asking within these goals that then drive what information you're going to look for? So if you remember those four categories, here are the questions that, that we heard people asking. In the first one, what data do we need to collect to inform systems that support teaching and learning? Well, that question sounds just like what they were pursuing pre-COVID. Now they're just looking at it differently to do distance or online learning. Category two, how do we extend the work of PLCs in our current reality? It's the reality that changed, right? Not the goal. <laughs> Category three, how do we engage parents and community members to extend learning opportunities for students? And category four, what do we do to cultivate positive relationships within the community? Chuck's going to talk about the shift through these lenses of systemic goals as we get into planning, and then you'll hear more show and tell from our esteemed guests who can really make this come alive. So in looking at the systemic goal number one, data and systems of support, 
the essence of this question really drives down to when we call systems of support, and we should call multi-tiered, I should say, or integrated systems of support. The thinking behind this first one is what information do we need to align our resources to that need? So it's about how do we walk with teachers and students during this time? So whether it be secretaries, parapros, interventionists, counselors, school psychs, school-wide personnel, how does data inform how we want to align these resources to walk with teachers and students? New questions cause us to seek out new kinds of data, and we believe that contextual data and perceptual data often is the most powerful data to help us understand. So in our new reality and creating systems of support, have we contacted each student? Have we been able to get in touch with each student and parent? Have they the capacity to do internet delivery? And are students engaged in the work? And this notion of student engagement has increased in sophistication from are they engaged, meaning showing up and still connected to school? Are they engaged, meaning are they learning? So I'm going to turn it over to Dave and Kim, and briefly, they're going to review this first systemic goal, which and about our thinking about data and systems of support. Dave? Thanks, Chuck. You can see how this data dashboard here has kind of shifted a little bit. Again, this is our 100-foot view. It's letting us know which percentage of students and number of students that were engaged or not engaged. And our definition for engaged, if they were working in three or more classes, they were engaged. If they were working in two or less, then they were not engaged. So that's, again, it gives us the 100 foot view. Uh, we're still worried about and checking in how are they doing and what can we do to support, but we needed to now move to like, are they doing the work in the classrooms to, uh, to just to, to push this to measure the engagement piece. And for us, it was also the more work we did right now was prepping us for next fall. So we wanted to test out all of our systems the best we could right now. So, And then this looks pretty similar to our pre-COVID individual dashboard. This is our kid level, kid, individual kids. And what we were finding when we were making the calls to find out, checking on the kids that were not connected, is that we were almost inundating families with calls. We had two and three people, sometimes four people calling just to check on them. So we knew we needed to make sure that our resources were being utilized the best way, most efficient, and not overburdening the parents too. So you can see on there, we've got started using our paras a little differently. We have our behaviorists, our uh, academic interventionists, and our attendance support people. And then we have our para pros that work with our spe special education and our EL students. So it was a way for us, we had a color code set up. It was just again for us to be able to see the kid level. So this is moving us now to be able to impact our kids more efficiently. And again, this is practicing for what, if we're online next fall, what it would look like. And I can tell you, this is something we'll, we'll take, even if we're feet on floor, we see the value of being able to do this and utilize our supports in our building. Dave, would you, would you mind just mentioning quickly what the success triangle is? Yeah, so our success triangle, to get onto this, our individual spreadsheet, it's students that are failing three or more classes, tier three attendance or tier three behavior. And so obviously the behavior is adjusted because they're not in the building, but we knew who our be tier three behavior were before they left the building. So we, we chose to continue work using that as our tier three definition for, for behavior. And again, this is our grade level counselors, our social workers, attendance specialists, behavior specialists, academic achievement support people. So that's, it's already sitting at the table, making sure that we're doing surround sound with the students that need it. So at Chief Kamayakin, we had collected our data dashboard and identified students as red, yellow, or green based on engagement. And as we got further into the process, based on how much work they turned in or how much, you know, we, we had a scale for that, a percentage scale. And after about four weeks of the distance learning, teachers were introducing their new concepts. We had successfully reached almost all of our kids. We really wanted to create next steps to be able to finish out this school year as strong as possible. And like Dave said, what are we learning from this process that we can make this work for us next year, whether we are in the classroom here or we are distance learning again. So we developed this data protocol on this slide here to look at overall school dashboards. So we had all this data. So we wanted to compile all that data into one overarching protocol, a look at that to analyze this and to create our ahas and what, what's next. So it allowed us to look at our special pops, our EL, 
are SPED, as well as identified kids who were read three consecutive weeks. And the coloring might not make sense, but we looked at, did they make positive gains in our greens? Did we reduce our reds? And so that's how we were coming up with our yellow and green right down that CK overall change. That was just for us to identify. But on the right side, like I said, there was a place for noticings and ahas. So we, and not just we, the leadership team, but we as the grade level teams can put, what, what are our next steps? What do we need to do to support these kids, especially our identified kids that are three weeks or more in the red? And so we just felt that this would help us prepare for the fall and how we can better support the kids in the distance learning. On this slide, this, in the one-on-one -on -one presentation, I spoke about how the grade level teams that are made up of paraeducators, support staff like our interventionists, SPED support staff, and how they played an integral role about supporting the teacher. And this slide is actual uh, snapshot of what our actual data dashboard looks like. And we have developed this into a communication tool for all staff. So everyone's on the same page. They have to go to one document and they get all the information in one spot. So not only can the para see what's been communicated, but the teacher and the specialist or whoever might be asking about this one certain kid or a classroom. And it really helped with our communication. We were having multiple people make multiple calls and parents were getting inundated by that. And so this really helped us with communication. And you can see like we took colors and if there's blue, cells, they are getting packets, packets of paper versus online. But we still wanted to make sure those students were included. Are they engaging? Are they turning those packets back in? So we were identifying that. And the cells that have the little yellow triangles, those were our highlighted kids. If they were red or if they were yellow, we had Paris and interventionists targeting those kids and making parent contacts. Uh, so this has just been key in helping us keep that communication strong across our whole school when we are not here, we can't go next door and talk to the teacher. So it's been really a key piece in making sure that we're, we have everything in one spot. So looking at systemic goal number one, the important thing to think about, I think, what have we learned this year? What evidence have we collected or data that will inform us how we do our practice next year? So we've created something what we call the 45 day planning process. And again, you can find more about what that means in the coach's handbook, but really what actions can we take in the next 45 days to make sure that we're ready to rock and roll next year if we have some form of distant learning. We believe that we will have about a two week window in the beginning of the year and fall to get kids connected to our school or we're gonna lose them. And many of our students have dropped out already and have been disengaged in the work. So what's your plan of action to create data dashboards that are kids connected? Are they engaged? And how are we using our school-wide supports in a way that's more intentional around those kinds of questions? And how are you going to keep score? So in systemic goal number one, in preparing yourself for next year, what do you believe are your key action steps to know where kids are at? Are they working? And how am I using my school-wide people in a creative way to get them engaged in the work? Because after that first two weeks, it's going to get harder and harder to bring them back into the fold, so to speak, harder to find. I know Molly will share later, but when she started the process, there's only about 80 kids that they don't know where they're at. So how do we make sure we know where every kid is at and what kinds of supports, how can parapos play in the role, how can secretaries play in that role, how can counselors play, what is the roles they can play in a coordinated effort? so that teachers know that they're not alone in getting kids back engaged with them in the classroom. So we challenge you and your leadership team to reflect, think, and act as it relates to systemic goal number one. Moving into systemic goal two, now that we're talking about school-wide systems of support, now we're talking about what are the supports that we can do to support teachers in terms of delivering the content and distant learning. So in systemic goal, it's about how do we ensure there's a collaborative culture by focusing around what we call the CI framework, curriculum, instruction, assessment. Notice the issue here is, one of the big points here I should say, is we're moving from 
emergency learning of getting by and building our team so that it's around what we call content learning. So how do we get teachers to work more intentionally together, but more importantly, what supports do we need to provide teachers so that they are able to focus on learning how to become more effective in distance learning. Dave and Kim again will share some of the evidence that they're collecting that will support them in the 45 day planning process. So these were some questions that we were asking our teachers because we wanted to make sure as we were moving forward through this last part of the school year moving in the fall that we had information from them that was going to help us move our systems forward. So just some simple questions. What was going well regards to your student engagement? What do we need to do differently? What are some things that you want to try out to uh, before the end of the school year through your digital learning? So we, we just wanted to get as much information as we could from the PLCs and from the teachers to make sure that we've got a, a more advanced product as we move into next fall. And I can say the same for our elementary school. We just continued our PLC work. In fact, they're still doing their backwards planning days, which we do with our instructional coaches. And what can we do right now for what we've learned to make sure we are completely ready for whatever August might bring us? We have also done staff surveys and just trying to get, gauge everyone's needs so we're ready to meet those when we come back. As we look at systemic goal number two, what's an interesting note is that this is not four different boxes or goals. The big idea in systemic goal number one with data and systems is how does that link to what teachers are asking in terms of systems of support? So part of this process of systems of support and teachers and PLC work is quick turnaround time on kids that are not engaged or struggling, who to go to and how to get help as teachers for those students. So there's a connectivity between systemic goal one and systemic goal two, as teachers are employing and applying our kids learning and what supports they need, they're part of that data dashboard, this link between what they're doing and school-wide systems. And you know what we found out? The harder or more intentional we support teachers in their work, the more intentional they are in their work. They're more willing to work harder at developing processes that support students because they know, in a sense, we have their back when students that aren't, aren't engaged in that process. So with systemic goal number two, what are your teachers saying? What are the supports they need? Are they working collaboratively in terms of sharing the work as it relates to online learning and distance learning? How are they sharing their time and talents? So what are the things that you're hearing from the teachers? What kinds of evidence have you collected from your teachers that will inform you of steps that you can support them in their PLC and also link them to school-wide systems of support? The concern has been a struggle with younger students and maybe even some of the older students because parents are monitoring everything and they cannot speak openly and honestly about their parents or others in the household. Do you have any suggestions or helpful hints for somebody who's dealing with situations like that? Well, I can talk for the high school. Um, we actually, and it's gonna come up a little bit later in the presentation, so I'll just briefly talk about it. We have an online referral system that staff can use. It's also open for parents and then students can use it too. So it, it goes directly to our two social workers and they staff it. And then when they connect with that person, what is it? What's the next steps there? So that's one way we can connect with our older students. At the elementary level, one of the things we encourage schools to do and we've had good success is who's closest to the community and has a pulse on the community. Of course, it decide, uh, depends on the size of the community, but our paraprofessionals really are closest to the community. And we have found by either by polling parents or calls, other activities, they know the community and the, and the parents. And when they reach out, I think parents in general feel more comfortable with parapros. And we're actually doing action research right now in some schools where they're contacting our most disenfranchised or least engaged parents to say, what can we do to support you in that process? And trying to get a relationship going with the parent and the child to see if there's things we can do better in supporting them. And at times, it's surprising the information we get, but it's a good question and it's a tough question of getting down to kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and really knowing what's going on. So Dave, um, how many students are assigned to a particular person in the triangle model? Person maybe have 10 at the most to 15. When we first started off, it was a lot heavier because we were that was just the connectivity piece. If you looked at the numbers back on the previous slide, you can see that 
the numbers were actually pretty doable. And we get into the school year, it matched those numbers pretty similar too. What was your criteria for the colors green, yellow, and red? So we started off our beginning dashboard, green, red, yellow, and red. Red being no connectivity, not, not engaged at all. Yellow was just some, and green was engaged, participating in Zoom meetings, doing some work. And then about, I'm trying to think, about four weeks into the process, we revamped our criteria with our staff, and green was completion of 70% of the work and engage in engaging with their classroom. Yellow was anywhere between 30 and 70%, and then red was under 30 or little engagement at all. That was definitely teacher led in that. They were, okay, we're done. We know we can connect with our kids, but I'm only having a kid show up to a Zoom meeting. I can't mark them yellow even for that. So we really listened and kind of talked with people and as a staff decided to go to a a little refined, deeper model of how we identify those kids. So how about classroom teachers that have been inundated with the most responsibility for students? How do you spread the wealth with specialists like PE, music, EL, title, lab, coaches? So in the elementary world, I have teams at my school and it's kind of like the gardens we spoke of at the high school, but I have an interventionist or support person and a special ed certificated people that are with a grade level. And then there are paraeducators also assigned to them. And that's a system we currently already had in place. We took that same system and we just flexed to meet the needs of distance learning. We then added our specialists like art, PE, we added them as support people as well. That's just how we kind of address that. Do you ever share with the parents the criteria for engagement? The parent? Yeah, absolutely. We've gotten that out in our social media, also as well as phone calling. It's been, it's been published. The teachers share it with the kids. So yes, it has been. What are the things you're asking yourselves about in terms of our current reality around delivering content learning and also knowing that kids are okay? And what data are we collecting, how we're keeping score, and who is the most appropriate people at the appropriate time to create those supports? And engaging your school-wide people, counselors, school sites, behaviorists, behavior specialists, et cetera, engaging them in the work with you, and make sure there's strong communication between your systems of support as it relates to teachers and what they're experiencing from distance learning. Again, you'll see some of those ideas and how to align your resources to your data and how to use school-wide supports more intentionally so that you're walking with teachers and students you can find in our coaches handbook. So I think this is the probably the toughest one and sometimes for us is how do we connect students, staff, and parents to the school and community through distance learning. As we talked earlier, Suzanne shared earlier the, the power of creating a sense of belonging, a sense of self-worth, and a sense of hopefulness by connecting students and parents to the school and creating this sense of, of belonging and building powerful relationships where we get a sense of self-worth and envisioning our future, a sense of hopefulness. How do we engage them? What are they telling us they need differently from distance learning? And this is really one step about how we maintain the culture of our school. Dave, kick us off with students, please. Perfect. So this was a new learning for me and for the counseling department. So the, the first task we had to figure out how to do was communicate with our 450 seniors to make sure that they knew what their graduation plan was after March 13th. There's a, an add-on in Google Sheets, it's called Autocrat, and it was definitely a time saver. And all three of the documents you see up there come from the Autocrat add-on. It did an individual letter with the student's name on there. The counselor could write a general note, and then it pulled off information from the Google Sheets. So you can see the far left, that's a letter that went to an individual student talking about what uh, their grad requirements were for them to do to finish out the school year. And then this, the middle two are just two different grad plans for individual students. So let them know what they needed to work on to make sure that they were ready for graduation. It went out email, the autocrat system does that. We did that for all 450. 
And then we mailed 410 of these letters out also. And then there was 40 that were off track that we wanted to make sure that those parents knew exactly what their grad plans. We'd met with them previously in the school year, but just one more time to make sure and ensure that they knew the exact plan for their students. And so we certified mail the 40 letters out. So this was a key, a new learning, and, and we've figured out how we're gonna utilize this, whether we're feet on floor or distance learning next year, it's a powerful tool. The next piece, and this is uh, the building, the culture in your, in your school and continuing that. We know that this is key when students are in the building. And now that we're with this distance learning, it's even more important. So we had to build a sense of normalcy. So right after March 13th, we figured out a way to continue to do morning announcements with our exec officers. We did ASB elections. We did virtual pep assemblies, senior nights, just all these different things, things that would help the students and the staff feel proud of being a part of our school or whatever school is doing this. How do we do our transitioning from eighth to ninth grade? All the things that we would normally do, we just kept moving forward and kept doing them. We had them in our calendar already and then we would get closer and we had to plan out what is that gonna look like now that we're doing this virtual and we did it. We, our ASB elections, the process is so slick that it's gonna be a process that we'll continue to do. This was so important that our students felt like they were connected to our school. You had staff members emailing saying, thank you for that virtual pep assembly. It seemed super silly when we first started thinking about it, but just for staff members to see videos and things like that of the school, what it meant to be a Grizzly, it was so important for our students and staff. Being a part of something bigger than themselves and then seeing that the work that they're gonna to continue to do is gonna help them down the road and, and help them stay positive with their future. So CBE was super big. We did all these different things. We did a moving up assembly and about 500 people on a Zoom. We learned some things that 14 year olds may shouldn't, shouldn't probably have the ability to send messages out. It was a fun thing to do. Our staff enjoyed it and our students definitely did. Then this was the previous system that we had in, in place, our online referral system. It's on our counseling website. We've had situations come up through social media, different things where we saw that there were some hot spots out there. So we made sure our students knew that they could refer themselves or friends that they thought might be struggling. Staff members, teachers could use this. And again, it goes into a, a Google form and then allows us to be able to make contact with those students that need that extra support. So my piece is about connecting parents and connecting parents with distance, distance learning has been a challenge for our school. Technology is not my greatest wheelhouse strength. Just uh, trying to build that and making sure we're connecting with our parents was big. And we just realized at our school that most of our communication, especially in the elementary, was done paper. We were sending notices home and everything's on paper. So we really had to look at what we currently had, our current systems, and expand on those and make sure that we were reaching all of our families. So we engaged uh, figuring out how to email all of our parents and then got on social media. So we were able to communicate, communicate what a red looks like, just like someone asked earlier, and make sure that people knew what was happening in our school. We really sought information through surveys of our staff. And I think Chuck alluded to this as well. I talked about paras being a really key piece they talk to all of our red kids and our red families that's part of their new job role in distance learning and so they were able to provide us with some big pieces what is holding them back what supports do they need it's definitely a work in process but we are wanting to be so prepared for the fall we're looking at all of the data from our surveys from parents and what the parents are telling us so we can make sure that we're reaching those. Across the district, we don't have a, a phone app that we can like send out information. So we've been pressing on that with our district leadership and they're in the process of getting that all up and running so we can practice with that and have it ready for the fall. So that's a key piece that we're excited about. Thanks, Kim. Do you engage parents in the scoring of students' grades since they are currently the educator? If so, how, and if not, why not? I know teachers have met with parents about their grades. They've been communicating with them with their phone apps and different things that they're doing. So that's been really key. And they're able to talk with a teacher about negotiating whatever type of grade. And we're really lenient on if there are things that are holding back parents and kids, the teachers I know have just been so amazing at working with families to go around and help with any obstacle. 
What I wanted to talk about was about how to engage with staff. And one of the things that I've been doing has been having, I've been having staff meetings. We do Zoom meetings once a week. That has been really, really valuable. I keep getting great feedback from my staff of thank you. I understand what's going on. When we talk about CBE, we're connected. They're feeling knowledgeable so they know where we're going. They're not feeling lost. That has been great. It's been opportunities for me to find out things. So like this was my needing help with how we were going to engage our students in the continuous distance learning. And so I needed staff to be a part of this. I was asking for my classified staff to come and be a part of that. And I needed to invite them. So this was about doing that, about making phone calls and how to do that. So the other thing that I was doing was finding out from staff, where were they at? What needs did they have? So this was my gathering of data from staff. Where were you struggling? What are your challenges? What are your successes? I did this in a Google form and then I wrote back to everyone on one sheet. So I took their questions and I wrote them back. And the reason why I did that was for a couple things. I wanted to one, make sure that all staff had an opportunity to feel comfortable asking questions. And then I wanted to put out those answers and responses. And I wanted the rest of the staff to know that others were asking similar questions. So it really did help create a sense of I'm not alone when staff saw other staff asking similar questions. It gave me great data to know what I needed to do. So there were some saying that, hey, I need to know more about Google Classroom. So then I was able to put out there, great, who is an expert with Google Classroom and is willing to do a session on it? And then I would have staff member who would do it. So that's that kind of piece too about, I didn't know that I needed to plan a session on Google Classroom, but it came out of my data and I responded and I didn't really worry about how I was gonna respond yet because I knew I was gonna figure out the answer once the question came up and that helped me to address it. So when we talk about CBE, one of the other things that I wanted to do was get a sense of where I was at, where I needed to grow. So it was kind of some reflection for myself as well, but to also again, teach the language. So I wanted to know if they felt connected and I didn't want to just ask the question, do you feel connected? But I wanted to define what that meant. So when I asked these questions, I, how connected do you feel? I'm Southridge strong. We're one under the sun. We've got it all the way down to, I feel like on the, I'm on the outskirts and everything's passing me by. So again, it was about that education for staff to know what it really meant. And, and I did that for each of these. And I wanted it to be a teaching piece. One of the things that I kept hearing back because we would have our staff meetings and I would be doing our surveys is that people were feeling frustrated. What am I going to do now that my students are motivated by grades? So that was such a great opportunity to talk about how we engage and that maybe it's not about grades and maybe it's about learning. So I put that question out there and then I got answers back. So here was my thing. I put it out there on a form and then I had in our staff meeting, I put this out to all of our staff. So I reported back, hey guys, so we had some great ideas on how to engage students that aren't based on grading. All of them were focusing on relationships. So that gave me an opportunity to put this back and you don't need to read each of those. I just want you to know, like by the color coordinating of it, it was just that those were different comments and they all focused about relationships. So that really helped me get that out there that what do we need to do as teachers? How do we need to be better at connecting with our kids? We need to be building our relationships and how are we doing that? And again, it goes back to CBE and how we're doing that we're relationships and powerful ones. So that was really fantastic. I cannot emphasize how important it is to be gathering this from your staff, asking questions. Again, I don't know what I needed to address. I jumped in. And it was only through asking of those questions did I understand what directions I needed to go. And again, so I, I go back to it's about the process. It's not about having the solutions. And by asking these questions, I am getting information. I am knowing how to direct us. I'm knowing where we need supports. People are feeling trusted. So I'm building relationships because you actually care about what I think and you actually want to help me move forward and not just leave me out here on an island all by myself because that's what I feel like in this distance learning. And then envisioning the future. Like I know where we're all going. I have a staff meeting every week and I know what direction we're going and I know what's coming ahead and I know how to then respond. So asking the right questions, repeating it back, giving answers and having that defined by the questions that are asked, I guess, again. In thinking back of the categories of systemic goals and the four categories and thinking about 
how do we, what data do we need to know to provide systems of support to teachers and students and parents? What do we need to know to support our work at the PLCs so that they are focused on and delivering quality teaching and learning? And also they understand to connect to systems of support. And finally, systemic goal number three, that's focused around connecting students, parents, and staff. So it'd be the same thing, doing some action steps what do we need to be ready? And that's the key. If we are planning our future and we're moving to an opportunity, how do we rethink and what do we know and what have we learned this year so we're ready to hit the ground running next year in the fall if distance learning is part of that paradigm, which I suspect it will be for many of districts. And so how do we re use our resources and planning to be prepared to meet the need at systems, at delivery of learning, and ensuring people are connected to our school? So I'm going to leave it with the big idea that this session was about planning for the future based on a known past and a really un unknown fall. And that we contend that the 45 day planning process can only occur, you can only engage in that kind of planning when you've got these types of systemic goals as anchors. And they're timeless. They, they don't go away. They don't change. Well, Dave could share with you a document where he shows 10 years of the same, am I exaggerating, 10 years of the same systemic goal. So the goals stay the same, the environment becomes chaotic and changes and the world shifts around you, but you have that to hold on to. It's a real gift actually, it gives you some peace in that work. We've often said you might want to use the handbook, that's that third column under print materials. So this is on the K-12 tiered supports page. You can find something called the Coach's Handbook. And I never remember the direct link to how to get there. I just go on the OSPI website and I go to the search bar and I put in K-12 tiered supports. And then you're going to get a whole page of resources where you can see that 45-day action planning, which is also in the Coach's Handbook in more depth. Also, we've got our books. There's two of them. What we think is cool is that they're all educational research and it's all Washington State. So it's you're not hearing about leadership from someone who hasn't worked in schools. You're reading about school change based on results in our own state where schools increased student achievement and decreased disproportionality. So we looked at dozens of schools and tried to, to put it all together there. And then of course, there is a playlist of other webinars that you can take a look at on that YouTube site as well. Thank you, Suzanne. I wanna thank Suzanne, Chuck, Dave, Molly, and Kim for joining us all day today. And I have a question. Have any of you had discussion about moving to standards-based grading toward the essential targets using a scale, such as the Connections Playlist, instead of grading being about work completion? At the high school, we're pretty close to that ideal. Anyway, the PLCs should teach to big rocks, and they're concerned about the kids understanding the big rocks in each of their content. I could speak at the elementary level. We are still having our PLCs and they're definitely focused on the standards as their content delivery. But I just think we are definitely a ways from making sure that we're all on the same page with that as we do online. But I feel like we have good conversations and planning with our PLCs towards that. Thank you. What are the LMS systems your schools are using? Learning management systems. We use uh, our student information systems, our power school. We're using Google Classroom right now, but we're having a conversation, at least for the high school level, to looking at a Canva or Blackboard or something like that, so that as our students move from the high school, they're, it's going to go into a platform that they're more likely to use. Schoology is one that we're looked at. We have some staff using that. From what we've heard is Schoology is pretty similar to Blackboard. So we'll be making that decision here in the next couple of weeks with some staff input for sure. Thank you. At the elementary level, it's definitely uh, Google Classroom and Seesaw at our school. We've been told by local districts, you need to teach your candidates our LMS system. The problem is I'm surrounded by school districts and one of them uses Google Classroom. We use Blackboard. Another one, the largest one, insists on Microsoft Teams. So probably that's what we're going to have to start teaching 
our candidates, but right now I don't think there's a consensus on one. And if there is, please tell me, because that would be so much easier for me than trying to teach everyone everything. Sure. Well, here's our contact information. Again, I'm Bonnie Zimmerman. I work at OSPI. We have the contact information for Chuck, Suzanne, Dave, Kim, and Molly. I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you all.